Good day, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our very interesting topic to Nobleco Serbia Pavilion. One warm welcome. I do invite you to feel like at home and do looking forward to this very interesting topic. As you saw, we are in a very interesting space. As I like to say to our uh, visitors, tourists, and our dear guests, they are in this pavilion, we're taking people to space, time, and different uh, dimensions. And this area of COVID uh, and the, chi and, um, special measures, you know, careful planning of the spaces is very, very important, especially in the field that we're going to speak today about the co-working spaces and the conjoint initiatives. I invite you to enjoy the conference and uh, would like to ask Misha to take over. Thank you. Try number two. Can you hear me? I I can be I can be louder. I can be louder. Okay. Okay. No, this is okay. This is okay. I will I will yell. Oh, this. I will yell a little bit. So, uh, first of all, this is really really great. Uh, this is the second uh, offline event for me in the last 20 months. So this is amazing to see people and to share the vibe the energy with you and really I applaud all to you for finding the time and opportunity to be here with us and to share the insights of the topic which is very very important now and definitely will be important in the future. So I will briefly introduce myself. Uh, my name is Miroslav Miatov but uh, everybody knows me as Misha. Uh, I'm the founder of the first co-working space in Balkan. Uh, definitely in Serbia. Uh, some of my friends even call me the godfather of uh, co-working of Balkans. Mm -hmm. So, j just the godfather, yeah. yeah so, so, be careful. I might ask for a favor one of these days. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, after that, uh, I, I'm the project lead of uh, co-working. Uh, the first one was held in Belgrade with the huge support of Serbia uh, Creates uh, and it was amazing really, it, uh, it was in 2019 and there were more than 300 people from all around the world, uh, people from 33 countries and we were all sharing the, our knowledge and insights about co-working and co-living and it was really, really amazing. People are still talking about that so maybe we will consider this this uh, uh, pandemia stuff uh, interrupted last somehow, so we will try to do it again, maybe in Belgrade, we'll see. So, uh, with the official part of the program, uh, we will have just one rule before we start. So, uh, Corona and COVID-19, whoever says that word today, he is obligated to put five euros in the jar because uh, uh, this is uh, COVID and Corona are the most Googled word last year. And we don't need to put that uh, uh, effort to, to talk uh, all the time about that. So we will consider that as a circumstance. You can call it a circumstance if you want to say something. You can call it a C word. Really, I don't matter. I, for me, it doesn't matter. But just don't say Corona and COVID. I dare you to say. I dare you to say. So, uh, there is no, there is no uh, more better place than Serbian Pavilion here in Dubai uh, to talk about uh, co-working and co-living and to talk about new ways of working. Because uh, all of, uh, Serbian Pavilion is all about the Vincha culture. And Vincha culture uh, ex uh, exists for, for existed 7,000 years ago when the migrants and nomads <laughs> How funny is that? Because today we're all talking about nomads and migrants, so it, it was the same in that period. 
uh, they, uh, when they were, were moving from the Middle East, they came to the bank of Danube in part of Serbia, which, which is called Vincha, and that is the first recognized uh, society which gathered, community which gathered in cities. So this is how people in that era were overcoming all the problems. How were they facing with the innovations? How were they, they transforming their lives for the better? So the first sewage system they had, hospitals, uh, uh, not just that, uh, the Vincha culture is the, the, the foundation of the metallurgy uh, and the first drops of metal were recognized exactly in Vincha, in Vincha culture. So uh, this is the ecosystem that was made and uh, there are no evidence that uh, this community gathered because uh, anything else but ecological and environmental issues. And so as far as I know and as far we have those facts, there are no uh, evidence of wars in that period. Uh, so, which is really, really amazing. We will have an opportunity to look a little bit further when we go to, uh, through the tour of the Serbian pavilion. So, for example, we will talk about co-working and co-living. And the urbanism was the concept that they implemented in that period, which is amazing because they had the first uh, the hospitals, sewage system. Uh, they, were, they were so good in crafting. Uh, they all those things are uh, telling us that uh, we have the evidence that the communities gathered for the benefits for the whole communities and that is very and that is very important and since we are going to talk about uh, how to build one community how uh, how the spaces are f for example there were also spaces in that period spaces who were uh, developing in order to make better lives and to make better work for the people from Vinci culture. So, uh, like I mentioned before, uh, the reasons, and I really need to emphasize that people, why they were gathering in the communities that we call cities today, were strictly environmental and ecological. So, we need to consider that culture as something that gave us a good foundation for what we need to improve these days when the new, cir new circumstances are uh, at the stage right now. So uh, that is why I want to wish you one more welcome to this conference and I'm really, really glad that you are all here. We will have a great uh, uh, panelists, we will have a great keynote. Uh, feel free afterwards to ask questions and once again, uh, thank you for being here. And this is for from my side. Uh, now I will, thank you, thank you, thank you, Kate. So I will announce now uh, the keynote uh, speaker. That's the Alex Ahom. Uh, he is one of the faces of co-working Europe. Not imagine any conference uh, about co-working that Alex is not there. Uh, he has uh, that issue of not being comfortable in his comfort zone. So he always steps forward. So he's an uh, Englishman. He moved to uh, Germany and established the first co-working space in Hamburg. Uh, then afterwards, he, he started working with big companies. Now he's uh, tackling with the uh, online medias and he's quite good creating uh, online communities like TikTok. Some of his views have all more than two, three millions of views. So he, he, likes, uh, he likes doing that. He likes creating communities. And besides that, he's doing a lot of uh, thing in uh, uh, consulting companies, uh, change management, conflict management. I need the help with that. Rem remember that. So there will be a lot of things that he will uh, uh, tell us and it will be very insight insightful for us. And his topic is uh, re-imaging the work culture of tomorrow. So Alex, please, <laughs> the floor is yours. Just the microphone and my notes, but thank you very much for that introduction. It was a wonderful introduction. I'll, I'll pay you later. Um, so, good morning, everyone. Yes, reimagining the work culture 
and the work's future. Um, good morning. My name is Alex Ahom, and I want to talk to you about a few things that really inspire me. I think that inspiration is important in, our, in, in how we work, how we live. We, we must be inspired. So some of the things I wanted to talk to you about or start, about, start with is change. Change, migration, and community. Um, again, thanks for the introduction. I think that we somehow have crossed paths. You'll see that in a minute, that uh, there's lots of overlap with our speeches, but um, it's an important overlap. It's, it's, it's a good one. So the first engagement I'm going to have with everyone here is slide number one. So can anybody here guess where the cityscape is on the left? Does anyone know where that is? We should have some idea, <laughs> considering which pavilion we're in, right, can anyone, so, um, if you know, don't be afraid to just, just speak it out, say it out, shout it out, it's Belgrade, yes, 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 exactly, the Danube, mighty Danube, amazing picture, lovely picture, more difficult question, the more challenging question, the place on the right. Does anyone have any idea where that is? <laughs> it's not England. <laughs> okay, I'll give you a clue. Well, you can give yourselves a clue. Um, guess the continent. Any... Africa. There you go. Yes, yeah, yeah. Celebrations. Excellent. We're building community, people. So, the country is Ethiopia. And the river is the Oma River. Now, people are starting to scratch their head. Why are we talking about Ethiopia and the Oma River? There's a very important connection between the river, Omo, and the Danube, the Ethiopia and Serbia. The connection is us, people, humanity. Now, experts, anthropologists, um, scientists, they believe we can trace all humankind back to the river. This basin, this area around the Oma River, Oma River uh, Homo sapiens um, have, have been proven to, to originate here. So a very long time ago, 200 years ago, I can imagine if we all close our eyes and, and think back to this time, people here, I'm, pro I'm sure, are very happy, very healthy, living off the land. The, the river is giving them their fish. The, the, the land is very fertile. But they're thinking to themselves, where is this river coming from? Where is it going to? The river changes, the river morphs throughout the year. We're here all year round, but where is this river going to? Like these that inspired people to actually start moving and start migrating. And experts believe this is why humankind started to migrate and change and move north. So, where, that's the big question. I don't have a clicker to go to the next slide. But you'll see. Oh. But anyway, I also don't have three hands, so it's fine. Uh, okay, you click. Yeah, community is the key. Sorry. You can hold the mic as well. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so, where did they go? So, this is a, a, a depiction of early human migration. Homo sapiens, as I said, as we know now, originated around the Omo River. And they, they, they spread out in different directions, but generally they moved north. And they moved north, they avoided harsh climates like the Sahara Desert and mountains and stuff. They came through this beautiful region we're in now. We're all very happy to be here in the Middle East. Came through the Middle East as we spoke of, as we heard from you as well. And they meandered north and, and, and kind of slightly to the left. And please, everyone, focus on the area where it says 40,000 years. So this area is an important area. So this is where those people from the Oma River decided to stop. And we know that when we have this, this fork, when, 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 when two areas divide, that's after an event happens. And that event was a settlement. As Misha told us, the first settlement of our human hope as sapien in Europe. And this settlement is the, I was going to ask everyone, what, what is this called? So the Vincha community started in that area. And, and that place where the road is, where the, where the people went left and right, is roughly Serbia, what is modern day Serbia. So one of the first settlements out of 
Africa was in modern Serbia. So why did they settle there? Why did they settle there you know, tens of thousands of years ago? And, 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 and we think the reason is because, like around the Omo, the, the ground was fertile, the rivers were raging, full of fish and everything they needed. The, the, you know, the opportunity was there, the weather was great, the, the people were safe. And in those conditions, that is where people thrive, that is where people flourish. And clearly, that is where people build community. So, from settling there, us to, to, to fashion uh, copper uh, tools, um, they also went from copper tools also the first community to, to build furniture, reusable and, and mass-produced furniture, and the world's first written language as well. So, um, of course, many of these peoples had languages, but the world's first written, written, written language could be attributed to the Vinci community in what is now modern-day Serbia. So a lot of things were happening based on this foundation of community. So time went on um, 8,000 years ago, and from building furniture, from building tools, they went on to create more. It, was, it became, they became more creative. Complex games have been found in archeological finds, um, artwork, pottery, these kinds of things. And so, so these people were the first to have all of these uh, accoutrements that, that we see today. So, so it's, it's a very interesting time. And as I said, the foundation is community. So what we can summarize from all of this is that environments that nourish us, environments that, that, that give us something, encourage us to stick around and stay. And these people stayed for a very long time, of course. And after that, they branched off east and west. And that is the end of our history lesson on the Vinci community. So next slide, please. <laughs> so we've spoken about the Vinci community, very in, in, interesting and important group. Um, but what is community? And that's my next um, engagement with the, cr with the crowd. What would, you, what would, you, what would your um, explanation or definition of community be? Can I get some ideas? What do you think community is? What does community mean to, to everyone here? I'm going to pick on you. What is community? Yeah. Anything else? Any ideas? Support? Yeah, excellent. There are no wrong answers. I think it's just important to, to think about what community is. And what I would say is what, what it isn't. Yeah, it isn't a buzzword. It isn't something that we should use to sell products or, or services. It's something very real. And I experienced community growing up in London. As, as we heard, I'm from London. I'm very proud of, of, of my city. Um, and London is a very dynamic place, um, but it's definitely something that is, is real. It's, 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 it's something that I felt, for example, um, in my part of London. I felt it, that in my school, um, and I felt that in sports teams that I have, have been part of, or sports teams that, that maybe we follow. We feel parts of communities that we, um, that we join, yeah? the, the brands that we follow, the things that we like. That, that, that is community, and community is, is like a feeling, a sense of belonging. So, uh, as I said, London is a very dynamic place. One in three people in London are actually foreign-born, and we have over 200 languages represented there. So many people like myself grew up in cities like this. We feel part of a, a macro community. So my school itself was, was um, in many ways, like these, these communities that we spoke about before, a, a, an amalgamation of people from all over the world, or, or at least people who have traveled a great distance. So my school was in London, but mostly of the people there were from, from, from India. We had lots of people from South, South America, Africa, Asia as well, and, and those, those experiences, those ideas, created a community that we all enjoyed being part of. And this isn't so uncommon. In, 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 in when I was growing up in, in the 80s and 90s, it wasn't so uncommon for schools to be mixed like that. And now we see companies and, and workplaces being mixed and, and seeing the importance of community. So I think community is strength because of the people, the individuals that, that, that make parts of, parts of it. 
So as, so as I said before, the important thing for us to recognize is the, 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 the diversity that, that comes underneath the umbrella of community. So next slide, please. So how does this happen? We spoke about community. Thank you for the slide, the slide uh, operation. How does this happen? We build communities, as I said, for, 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 um, for progression. We want to feel part of something. We, we, we need solutions, and community can be um, a very important uh, cog in that, in that process. And I'm, I'm no stranger, I'm not a, a great traveler like the, the Vincha people, but I'm no stranger to, to this concept because, as we heard, I am from London. Uh, London is my comfort zone. Um, I decided myself and my family to move out of my comfort zone and go to Germany. Um, as we know, we don't learn so much, we don't grow so much in our comfort zone, but um, The family and I decided to move to Germany, and um, I didn't have a job in Germany, so it was it was tough. It's, it's not an easy thing to do, but we still change, we migrate, we move. But I did have my values, I did have my experiences, and these things are very important when it comes to community, to people. So my values, I speak about a lot, and those things are community, collaboration, accessibility, openness, um, and and that means a lot to me. Connected with my experiences working in, in media, in, 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 in HR, in hospitality, in tech. And I'm very clear about what I want to achieve in my life. And, and what I want to do, and what I still want to do, is to make the world of work a better place. And um, I've spoken a bit just now about why that is, but, but I'm, I've always been fascinated about the world of work and building workspaces or being part of the change of workspaces. So with that, um, I realized I have a, a kind of um, an interest in people with a growth mindset. And again, it's these kinds of things, these thoughts that drive people to make changes and want to belong to something. So next slide, please. <laughs> Thank you. So I speak a lot about, um, um, as I said, sustainability. That's one of my, uh, uh, one of, one of my favorite core values. Um, and I speak about it a lot when it comes to community building, when it comes to um, change in the workplace, because I think it's misunderstood. Sustainability is very important when it comes to communities, travel, movement, change, business, but we must, we must make sure that our structures are sustainable. So, um, as I said, I get invited to speak about diversity, inclusion, these kinds of things, because people are starting to realize that the old way of work is not working so much anymore. It doesn't work for more and more people. Workplace um, dissatisfaction is up. Um, absence from the workplace is up 7% in the last three years. So things are not looking so good. When things don't look good, when things are broken, what do we have to do? It's a question for everyone. What do we do when things are broken? We fix them, we fix them exactly. So what's happening now is people realize that the world of work, our workspaces, the way we work, it's not working and it's broken and we must fix it. So as I said, I have moved for jobs. Many of us, I'm sure, have moved industries. We've moved uh, countries. So that is the first step to change. We must acknowledge where we are on the process and keep on changing. So, you know, a personal story to make it kind of more relatable. I moved to Germany looking for a job, looking for my next career path for over a year, applying for things that I thought were, were right for me, for right for my people. But I realized that it, it wasn't going to happen that way. So I had to build my own space for, for myself and people like me. And that's very reminiscent of the venture community again. You, 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 you have to travel outside of your comfort zone, and when you don't find what you're looking for, sometimes you have to build it yourself. I met loads of people who weren't happy with what they did. They didn't like their boss, they didn't like their, their colleagues, they didn't maybe see the vision that, that, they, that, that, that their leaders had. They didn't even see themselves as a, as a 
explorer as a hero in their own journey, and I couldn't identify with that. So I realized that I had to build a community of people or, or be part of a community that, that could see things the way I did. And if I saw things that way, it could be other people who were isolated as well. So, as I said, as Misha said as well, that, that uh, I'd build online communities before with the power of social media. I build offline communities with the spoken word and with actions. And it wasn't easy, but it was definitely worthwhile. And I would definitely say when building community, when building new workspaces, when building new companies, the outcome is much more important than the income. And I will say that again, because it's a very important thing. So my platform that I made, my, my business, um, it was very much a, a global idea, um, but, but not uh, forgetting the importance of the, of the local identity. I think that's important when we build spaces, when we build offices, build businesses. You can have these grandiose ideas, these big ideas, but never forget the local identity, the local feeling, it's important. You can't copy and paste what you think from here and put it somewhere else. There was something that we, we shouldn't forget. So shared my co-working space, the space that I started, uh, as we heard, was the first of its kind in northern Germany. Um, but I was a one-man band in 2014, and maybe, as well as we know, the saying goes, timing is everything. So maybe I was a bit early to the market. Uh, but as I said, definitely, um, after six years of growing the business, growing the community, I realized once again that the outcome was more important than the income for me at the time. So what does this all, uh, what does the future hold for me and for us? Well, I'm standing here today after all my adventures traveling, not so far as the venture people, but um, my adventures across Europe. I'm st st standing here today as someone who is very well connected in different markets. I have a lot of experience and stories that I'd love to share about building community, building office spaces and, and, and teams, which I think is quite relevant to our discussion about mobility. Um, but as I said, I'm also very, uh, after closing my space in the beginning of the pandemic, 2019, uh, I'm still very optimistic about the future of work and how we can change um, and, 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 and remedy some of the, the situations that we have here. Uh, despite my doors being closed, I'm very happy to help other people open doors for themselves. Work is changing. Uh, demographics are changing us. And I think that it's time we realize that how we work, where we work, how many hours we work, that all has to be flipped on its head because of, of as I said, the stress that we're under and, and, the, and the time that we put into work. Traditionally, we do office, modern work in offices, but we've realized that, not, not corona, but the pandemic, the pandemic, <laughs> pandemic, <laughs> the pandemic, the pandemic has shown us that we don't have to work in traditional offices. We don't even have to work at home. We realize now that we ask us, ourselves questions, where is home? Many of us have left small villages or small towns to go to bigger cities, cities like mine, cities like London, Dubai, Singapore, New York, but we realize we don't have to do this anymore because we can work in a different way. So it's, it's important that we're conscious of how work is done. A friend of mine has a co-working space in Bali, and we spoke about the changes of work a few years ago, and, and he mentioned he could see the first wave of digital nomads coming to Bali at the time. And now if we're not careful, but now if we observe it, now if we look closely, we can see that that migration has already happened. His space is full. Digital nomads occupy his space, you know, every, every table. And also, not only digital nomads, but flexible workers from all of those cool companies that now value diversity and inclusion, they are also working in Bali and Dubai and wherever. So work has changed. The location of work has changed. So we can even see people, important people like the, the president of Serbia talking last year about opening the borders of Serbia to, to foreign workers for, for, um, for, for work visas and work permits, making it easier for people. So, next slide please. Thank you. So, I think, it's, as I said, it's important for us to realize that, that work has changed and we can now drive where it goes in the future. Yeah. 
potentially uh, uh, the history will repeat itself. I've been talking a lot about flexibility. I've been talking about community. And those two things have impacted work and life more than we realize. And that is why work-life balance is almost impossible because work and life are not are the opposite ends of a spectrum. They're not different things. Work and life are very similar. And we have to realize that. So I have a question to close my, my, my talk with everybody. I have, a, I have a question for us. Knowing what we know now, knowing that millions of people don't have to leave cities like Belgrade, like countries like Serbia, to find meaningful work, knowing that now, where do we want to go in the future? And what does that mean for us? That's my question. Thank you. <laughs> Again. Everybody likes Alex, so yeah. thank you, Alex, for this great speech. Uh, and really, we didn't talk about uh, his presentation, so my facts and his facts were totally coincidental. So, but if you were wondering uh, why we serve things that we are so important, Alex explained everything in a few <laughs> slides with immigration and everything, so thank you. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, Alex gave us a great foundation for the next conversation with our lovely panelists. So I will ask all the panelists to join me here on the first two rows, and I will introduce every one of you shortly, and then we will start uh, with our questions. So please. Whatever you like. It's your pavilion. Yeah, yeah. Or should we just like, come, come closer? Yeah. Let's see what he says. Okay. It's easier for the camera. I if you are, yeah. That's why we moved. <laughs> there, I can see. Informal, informal. Yes. Great, I will start with you. So. <laughs> <laughs> so, this is Julian Becker. We have one. Uh, she has a long history of leading communication based projects. Uh, I know for a fact that uh, before she was uh, working on a project to save some animals. Maybe she will explain that uh, a bit later. But uh, also, she's a co founder of uh, Coconut Co Living Place. It's one and a half hour uh, near uh, Berlin. And if, if you haven't been there, please go there. It's amazing. I never told you that, but when I was in uh, uh, Coconut, I uh, lost in the woods. Uh, somehow I, get, I, I got lost there, but it's, it's, it's really a nice place. And all, all the people who are living there were so nice to me, and they were showing me the way how to, uh, to get to the colleague's place. So uh, Julian is also uh, connects the dots from the various industries. And her network is spread from the cultural scene of tech, politics, and also with the experience in the NGO sector. So uh, you should definitely, once again, I invite you. I, can I invite them to please. come to? Yeah, yes. please. Please go to the co uh, Coconut uh, Calling Place. It's really nice. Uh, the next one is Kate or Katarina Maiolini. Uh, this morning, I... Uh, I learn something that she is very disruptive, but in positive way, when it comes to technologies. She is a head of ambassadors of uh, CoLive platform. She also comes from the fashion and financial industry, but she's also aware uh, with the real estate projects. Uh, she uh, is doing an amazing job. We met uh, in Belgrade also. Uh, in 2019, and uh, from that point, uh, we became friends, and uh, what she did for the co-living community all around the world is amazing. So, she is the one who is that drive for the uh, co-living spaces which are uh, establishing and developing all around the world. Uh, she lives in London, but like all of us, she is a nomad. Uh, you can never caught her in. Uh, you can never catch her in London. She's always somewhere else. So uh, Anna Ilic, uh, 
uh, Anna. Hello. Uh, she is a senior advisor to the Prime Minister of Serbia for Creative Industries and Tourism. And she will present the concept for, uh, of Creative and Innovative Multifunctional Center Lozionica. Uh, for people from Portugal, it's very easy to say Lozionica because of your zh, uh, but uh, we will call it for all the others around house. And for, I would like to emphasize that Anna, she is that silent force behind the Serbia Creates platform, and she's the supporter of uh, so many networks in Serbia who are making this creative industry visible to everyone and she so far she's doing a great job with her team so thank you Anna for that so the next is Stephanie Brisson she's from Canada the French part but uh, she lives uh, in Germany for quite some time she uh, she also has an experience in uh, making communities and co-working spa spaces. So, uh, sh uh, she founded the first co-working space in uh, Canada. Then afterwards, she moved to Germany and then she opened the co-working space in Berlin. Ahoy, right? And after that, uh, she decided uh, to work something, uh, uh, something a bit different. And then she started working with the tech space. Uh, that's the company that provides uh, uh, the technology, uh, IT companies provide the whole services uh, for them to make their uh, job easier. And she uh, did that for quite some time and she was the, uh, the leading the German team and helped develop the company's European expansion. Uh, and now she is doing something very similar to that. She is uh, working with the Get Your Get Your Guide. Uh, that's the platform uh, also uh, where you can book the best experience in destinations across the globe uh, since nine, uh, since when, 20, uh, 2009. Uh, they made it easy for millions of travelers, remote workers, digital nomads to find some unique experience for them to remove. And today it's a bit different because then we were talking about moving just as an individuals. Now we are uh, talking about moving the whole teams uh, to relocate them in any part of the world. Uh, the, sec the next one is Mubarak Moaz who we also all met in Serbia, in Belgrade, in 2019. Uh, she's uh, so much into uh, tech startups and industry that she decided after Belgrade, when, she, when he was so inspired to, found, uh, to, found, um, to establish his startup, uh, Ace Place, uh, which is, uh, according to my humble opinion, a fast-growing development platform for shared offices. And uh, he started doing that just before the pandemic. So it will be very interesting to hear his experience when he was all pumped up. So I will conquer the world and everything with my platform. And then, bam, uh, pandemia hit very, very hard. But we will hear also his experience. And we have Daniela Marzan. So <laughs> how to start that? When there is no solid community in any part of the world, she will go there and make one. Uh, and she moves a lot. So it, uh, she move, uh, moves into the city, into city to city, countries. She is one of the non-founding members of the, for, in my opinion, the best case of co-working spaces, uh, Beta House in Berlin. Uh, they are really the best case of how should one co-working space operate and to open all the branches around the, uh, around the Europe. Then afterwards she said, okay, that's, uh, I did this, so I will do something else. Then she moved to Lisbon and with the cooperation with Beta House, they established uh, uh, Beta Lab in Lisbon and they established uh, uh, that community and she was in the early stage of advocating with the European Parliament about uh, co-working spaces to be recognized from a side of any, kind, any government. And uh, uh, afterward, with our mutual friend, Fernando de Pina Mendes, uh, they opened an LX factory. They found it and that uh, it was, I don't know if it's still, uh, it's closed, uh, but just a few months. Yeah, yeah, C word. Yeah, because of the C word, uh, it's closed. But uh, it was one of the best projects of how to 
uh, uh, how to uh, make an impact on the community with the architecture, with the, with the city. Uh, they included all the elements in uh, how to support uh, Alex Factory. So she will give us the better insights how they did it uh, in, in Portugal. So, and now we will start with the questions. We will have uh, three rounds uh, of questions and, uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. First round of question, I will direct to uh, Julian and uh, Stephanie. And uh, we will talk about the initial idea of how they started their uh, communities, their places, and how that has changed since that moment when you, for example, it's five, six or ten years ago, what was your passion? What was your motivation about opening those kind of spaces? And how are the circumstances have changed, especially in the last year and a half? What has changed? How the communities were reacting to that? Uh, and uh, did you have any kind of support from the local communities and, of course, from the government? So please, uh, Julian, let's start with you. So I'm Julian Becker, and we opened Coconut, which is, as you said, is in the countryside just outside of Berlin. Um, it, Coconut actually stands for community and concentrated work in nature because we, from the very start, knew that community was an important element of our project. Um, I have experience working in the co-living field for more than 10 years, which is crazy to say. <laughs> Um, but because of that work and because of research into these types of workspaces and productivity and just basic human needs for many, many people, not everyone needs other people, but about 90% of us do, we built community into the project. Um, we, we did that in a few different ways. So we considered that the people who came to our space, so people come to Coconut for any amount of time from, say, one night, uh, they can come as a coworker if they live in the region. They can stay overnight. They can stay for six months. They can stay for a year. So we knew we wanted to make a, uh, a place where all of these people who find themselves in our space have a chance to get to know each other. That was one element of the community building. And the other element of community that we really considered from the very start was our activities in our local community, so the residents of the place where we were staying. So. We, we've always considered to not be a UFO in the middle of the countryside, but rather to actively invite our neighbors to our place. And it is an act, active thing. It is not something you can expect that your neighbors will come to see you. You really have to find reasons to bring them and find um, reasons that they want to be there and that they can also feel um, an identity with the place. So Coconut has created a way of, of um, all these different people to identify with coconut, to feel at home at coconut, or even just to be curious and see what's going on. Um, and that's always been important for us. And I can say from the, the beginning, because you mentioned the, the word that shall not be named, <laughs> that in the beginning when we first built this project, we had considered individuals and small groups would be the main uh, use case for our place which actually turned out to not be the case until the thing that we cannot talk about. Um, so we closed for two months, and then when we reopened, we were only able to host individuals, and in a very different way. And over the last two years, what we've seen is that many, many more individuals come, and many people came from the city because in the city they were really alone, and at our place they actually had a chance to talk to people, <laughs> to people they don't know, to get to know new people, which they were desperate for, so people stay for many months now when they come. Not, it's, it's changing again because the world is more open, um, but I would say there is a good 12 months where people were coming and they were just like, first a little bit afraid because they could be in a space with other people, but actually so happy that they stayed for many more for months, which has never happened before. Yeah, it's and a it retreat really for loneliness. <laughs> and the funny thing about the community, when I was there, uh, one day, one person uh, waited me in front of the reception. The next day, uh, the same person was serving food for me. 
the other day we were uh, together fixing one uh, wooden uh, boat, so it's really about the whole community. We were all involved in all the activities that were happening. So, it, and, and the other day I was in the kitchen and I, I met this, the same guy with me. We were, we were washing dishes, so it's like... Oh my God, it's you all were there in the beginning. Yeah, <laughs> yes, I was there it in the beginning. But that's the best part. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There was a lot more of the... <laughs> where everybody's helping to fix boats and do dishes, but... Yeah. I can guarantee now if you come, you probably don't have to do dishes. No, I, I, really enjoy want to. I enjoy it. If I you really want to, you can. Yeah. I'll find a way. <laughs> Thank you. Steph. Thanks. I, I think it's worth going back a bit of what I've done before, what I'm doing now to understand how community loops in and to get your guide. Uh, like Michelle mentioned, I used to be in the co-working industry in Montreal. Then when I moved to Berlin, I still immersed myself into this. I started working with the freelancers, then the small companies, then when I was in tech space with the bigger companies. And one thing that I noticed as I move along this growth curve was that the bigger the company, the more inside the company there's a need for community as well. When it starts as a startup, everyone is nearby, everyone is close to each other. But as the company grows, when they pass, I would say, 30, 40 people, then there's departments, there's sub-teams. And then when we reach, like we are now, 450 people within an organization, the community is still very much to be worked on. You have the engineering, which are working in a certain way. You have the sales guys, which are out and about, working in a totally different way, speaking sometimes a different language. You have the, the, the care, the support team. It's within an enterprise, within a business, there's a need to create this community and get your guide the, the, the hat that I'm wearing today is not so much the product, but really looking at the workplace, looking at the employees, and taking the best of co-living, co-working, and introducing it within the workplace of a single company. We have, uh, in just before the pandemic, uh, acquired a huge building in Berlin to create a campus, to create the sense of community where people would want to come. On the back of the circumstances, we also look at our culture. What do we want to be? What, how do we want to work? And what was becoming clear to the founders, but also to everyone in the, in the company is we, are, we value in-person interactions. We want to keep interacting. We want to have this, this collaboration. And that really is what, uh, what was hard for us in the last year and a half, and also what will pull us in, in the future. Now, that's not going to be an easy transition. We've been working remote for a year and a half. I cannot say, hey, guys, everyone, tomorrow, come back to the office and act as if nothing happened. It's going to be hybrid. I mean, we've just heard it. Right? People value their personal time. People value their mental health much more. How can we integrate that within the workplace? And I think that is through the people that you work with, how you structure that, and how the environment is physically designed to gather or to, you know, to have people gather or socially just interact, not just through, through Zoom. So I would say that's the, the transition and also looking forward, the challenge. Yeah, I can say that uh, the way we will work in the future and how we are working today uh, is becoming uh, one of the basic human needs because it's a, a huge amount of uh, the hours per day that we spend at work, like Alex mentioned. We cannot divide personal and uh, working. It's, it's, very, it's combined, it intercepts each other, so it's, it's very important. And it's all about that interaction and how we will deal with the needs of people, individuals and teams who are coming to our spaces. So thank you, Steph. So the next question is for Daniela. So like she's, uh, she was in the front lines of creating something amazing and big. One in Berlin, one in Lisbon. Totally two different mentalities, different cultures. And I would really like for you to share with us uh, your experiences because they, they, they must be a bit different. How was that when you were uh, establishing a better house in Berlin? And how was it uh, in the sense of uh, uh, people who were working on that project? How was uh, the whole project look like when you worked in uh, Berlin and in uh, Alex Factory in Lisbon? Thank you. Um, well, there is one commonality to all the countries where I've been to trying to 
put the seeds of co-working into a more or less fertile soil. Um, I would count to Portugal and Germany also um, the MENA region, Algeria and, and Egypt and Latin America. And there is one commonality to everyone. They say, oh, this doesn't work here. We are not like that. This only works there. And it's, it's really um, funny how, uh, you know, the Arabs say, well, we, we, we Arabs, we're like really shy. We don't like to share. And then the, the Latins say, well, oh, this shareism thing that you let people look at what you're working and, you know, uh, share ideas with you won't work here. People steal ideas here. And then you go to um, Bucharest. I'm actually also uh, from the Balkan space. Oh, no, no, Romanians are too skeptical about sharing. You know, we had this thing called communism. People don't trust anyone, you know. And this was a commonality. Then the Portuguese, of course, would say, oh, this only works in Berlin, you know, it will never work. Um, so even in Japan, um, I, I, was, I was talking to a university professor researching on how crises has um, pushed this... Um, this trend forward of co-working and also of, of design methods or human design methods. And um, while in Tokyo, co-working spaces were popping up um, right after the, the environmental crisis of Fukushima, um, there were sociology professors telling me, you know, our culture is not made for that. So uh, what I found everywhere is really this, um, this, this common um, instinct of saying, this will not work here, not in my culture. And I think it's fear. I think it's really fear of trying out something uh, that is so humane and so common sense that will basically deconstruct pretty every single social structure that you have and where you feel comfortable. Um, and maybe to dive a little bit into the Portuguese um, example, um, it was funny how we entered as, as foreigners, basically, um, planting some seeds with some events, with good drinks and food. That's how you bring people together. Um, and then three different projects that were already doing co-working uh, projects or maker spaces, hacker spaces, would come separately and say, look, we are working on this, but we don't want to share it yet because it's not ready. And then someone's like, look, we are working on this. You know, and, and so we used this foreigner bonus Oh, and then put everyone on a panel and just discarded all the secrets to everyone. And that's how the um, Beta E, the biggest startup ecosystem in Lisbon, actually emerged. That's how people actually started to talk with each other instead of hiding these projects from each other. Um, and I think, I think that was um, something that might happen everywhere. So you need some disruptor from the outside to be a little bit ignorant maybe or to play a little bit with the foreign factor and to bring people together that might at the beginning not trust each other and berlin is a different story i mean different in berlin planets. it just it just it just flowed yeah, it was it, 2008 it, it, after the financial crisis it's just um, yeah but after the uh, world crisis it was a necessity absolutely the people, the people gathered around that idea that absolutely. the place uh, where squatters were gathering yeah. to make something where creative people... It was very come. easy. Uh, yeah. yeah, exactly. Very easy. And it was abandoned building, and you start with 200 square meters. With 30 people, just yeah. friends of friends yeah. of friends. And everybody brought their chairs and yeah. uh, what they found in the garbage or sofa or something like oh, that. They brought yeah. there, and they start working, and they become uh, okay. one of the biggest... <laughs> we, we got some donations. Yeah, yeah, some, yeah. We got some donations. It's called Upcycling Now. It was a... Yeah. a design thing we yeah. did. <laughs> but, but actually, the first reaction, uh, as, as all of the humans, is uh, uh, that we don't like changes. And we need sometimes to force uh, something that can be changed and to show that to the people, even though they don't like it. And to, crises to get out do of that. The comfort zone. So never miss a good crisis. Because crises do that. Yeah. So this is the perfect moment to do that, this crisis now that we cannot talk about. We cannot talk about. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, uh, huh. and we come to Mubarak now. So this is for me very, very special because uh, we met uh, in 2019 in Belgrade 
uh, at the conference, and he was very inspired, as le at least uh, he told me that, that he was inspired with uh, everything that he uh, heard at the conference, meeting people, panelists and everything, and afterwards he uh, came to Dubai and started something new. Uh, which is very, very related to this, how we call it now, industry of shared offices, co-working and co-living. So uh, for me, this is a very special moment because we closed that circle. So from Belgrade to this, where, you, where this, is your, this is your town where you are local. So please uh, tell us something about your experience, your journey from Belgrade to uh, the platform that you are developing right now. Great, well, obviously, I love the city. I thought Belgrade was very pretty. And I had a great experience there in general. Actually, uh, one of the merchants in the local vegetable markets even offered me his daughter's hand in marriage. Um, <laughs> I am, and I might take him up for that offer so I can go to conferences and say that the community even gave me a wife. Yeah. That happened in Bailonia Piazza for all the ones who, who are from Belgrade. So <laughs> I just um, explained it. So, Essentially, I'm a tech guy, and when I came to CCCSEE, I had an idea and a product that I was very excited about. And the conference was the first place that I got access to a bunch of experts um, with the best experience and knowledge about the co-working industry from all over the world. And because the conference was organized and set up in a way that allowed those people, those experts and very knowledgeable people, and some of which I'm actually sharing the panel with today, um, to share their knowledge in a very easy way. It allowed people to really engage uh, in a very unique way. I would say I almost got a cheat code to gain very deep knowledge of the industry, much more than what I thought I knew. Um, but more than anything, really understand what I should be focused on. And so by the time I came back to Dubai in uh, uh, October 2019, um, really because of the conference, I had a very clear idea of what problem I should be solving and what product I should be building. And it was very obvious to me that I should be focused on building something that allows people to be able to come together in a very effortless manner. So I could talk for days for the kind of impact that uh, Serbia had on me. <laughs> um, but essentially, it has Serbia, well, to be, uh, to be specific, the conference uh, is a huge reason why I have the job I have today. So um, I have to say thank you to you, but you know, that's, 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 it was, that was awesome. You're more than welcome, and you should also thank Anna because they were the partners of Serbia Creates. For, they were partners for the, that conference. So uh, thank you for, for this insight. Uh, I knew that story, but I didn't know uh, about the marriage proposal. <laughs> I know where that happened, but I didn't know about that proposal. So uh, you shared with us your inspiration, and now... Uh, as you heard from uh, Mubarak, Anna, uh, that was his drive to do something better, like he said, to solve some kind of problem. And we should all be doing that. All the projects that we are working on, we should be solving some kind of problems with our concerns of somebody else. So what is your inspiration for uh, the next big thing that will happen uh, and that will be created in Belgrade? And I know that Serbia Create is doing a lot on uh, promoting creative industries, supporting networks, and I know that you see Serbia and Belgrade as a melting pot for creative industries, so people, that, uh, so people all around the world can come. So what is the strategy and what is the vision for Lozionica or Roundhouse uh, in Belgrade for the next period? <clears throat> um, thanks for this introduction, which is very <clears throat> good and honest. And, uh, well, for uh, Luzjorica, it's actually coming as a result, in a way, and will be like a flagship project, legacy project of the team that I lead within the Office of the Prime Minister. 
uh, where we've been working on the creative industries for the last uh, four years. Um, we, it is a part of the industry that no one, the government never used to look at or work with. And I come from, my background is in creative industries. Filming. So when I got it, sorry? Filming, right? Film, mostly yeah. film production. So when I came to the Prime Minister's office, thanks to my boss, who understands and gets this very well, and is also one of those people who pushes us to dream big, aim higher, go faster, and have big ambitions. Um, I got to do everything that I always wanted my government to be doing for the industry. And so it's a dream come true, and which is why I enjoy it so much. And having a physical space that will be a co-working space, but a bit more profiled, I think, in comparison to yours, towards uh, creative industries and innovation, it comes like a dream come true, really. And we found this wonderful industry heritage building that's the old railway roundhouse that's just completely depleted, sitting in the center of the city and in the heart of the new de urban development, which is the Belgrade waterfront, which is also the biggest UA investment in Serbia. It's now, like, this is the whole residential commercial area, so we believe that our roundhouse that will bring creators and artists and innovators to the area will bring a lot back to that community and will make it uh, beautiful and not just sleep, shop, do the usual work, but let's actually get together. Um, and uh, you know that Serbia, obviously, has a lovely network of co-working spaces, 40 plus, I think, now, yeah. and uh, is already established as uh, one, top, one of the top nom uh, digital nomads destinations of the world, which is fantastic and completely organic. It just happened. No strategy from the government or anybody, really, which is great. Organic. You know how they say uh, what's the difference between uh, communities and vegetables? Uh, there is no, because uh, they are the best when they are natural, organic, and locally grown. So Exactly. Yeah. That's exactly it. So with our space that will be government-driven, we want to be very careful not to be competition to the private commercial co-working spaces, but to actually support the entire network and fill in a gap that's really missing, and that's having a space for artists and creatives where they can gather, work together, and there are two reasons for this. I mean, there are many reasons, but let's say two top reasons for this. One is that the artists, the culture generally in Europe, especially in our area, I think, is very institutionalized, and there are museums, there are schools, there are established artists. So for young artists to get exhibited anywhere is such a tough job. So we want to make this space where they can create work and exhibit their work. So we want them to really own this space um, altogether. That's one side of things. The other side is what we've been supporting all the time, is uh, putting together people of completely different backgrounds and profiles so they can work together and build something completely new. And the best example of that, for example, you'll see later at our exhibition upstairs where we saw hardcore archaeological scientists merge with a Is video it? gaming development company with the fantastic metahuman technology and now they join forces so the, the scientist guys managed to find um, actually they found a long time ago this um, skull of a human from 10,000 years ago and drew a genome out of it and now can say this person had this color of eyes, the, this color of hair, but was also lactose intolerant and those kinds of details. And with the video technology, video gaming technology, they're able to completely recreate this person exactly the way they looked and we get to even interact with them. So we'll see that upstairs. But we to, can call to him kind Vinko. of short, sorry? We can call him Vinko. Totally, yeah. <laughs> 
Uh, so this is, uh, this is what we want to do, actually, to have Los Gionica as a melting pot of where people can feel comfortable to experiment, work together, but they can come from all sorts of, all backgrounds, really. Uh, and it will also have co-working uh, parts of it, but also performing arts and event space and multifunctional, multi-purpose uh, areas for exhibitions, for experimental theater, dance, whatever. You are aware of the Serbian mentality and that the whole network of co-working spaces will see you as a competition, but it will take time for them uh, to well, adjust we'll this, hope, because uh, we know we will Which do is why we're working together yeah, exactly, with you already. Exactly, exactly. So, but from the start, exactly. we are going... We are it doesn't like it said, yeah, only in Berlin. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. Never. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So great, so Lozionica will become uh, something like a micro-location and uh, micro-city in the city. And when we are saying about that, we should uh, now address to uh, Katrina Maiolini because she's uh, researching and doing a lot of stuff with, uh, uh, com well, it's not completely new, but to the most people is very new concept of 15-minute cities. The biggest promoter and supporter of that uh, 50 minute city concept is Anna Hidalgo. She's the mayor of the of the Paris. So, what can you tell us, Kate, about the 50 minute cities concept and why is it so important? We heard from Anna's side that uh, the government is supporting to build that kind of uh, a location, physical space for all the people. So, what can you tell us about that? Um, first of all, I want to say I love the fact that you come from another industry. Sorry, I'm going off topic just one second. But I also move from one industry to another. First, because as Misha was saying before, I really like to disrupt. And I strongly believe that cross-pollination is really the key to innovation. Different somewhere, like I was saying, you can move from one country to another. Or from another industry, they just come in. And we were having this chat this morning, right? Um, they just come in with a different totally intake and they really need it. So I really like that. I just wanted to say that. Um, so 15 minutes cities, as Misha was saying, is actually a concept that was born by a professor in a university in Paris, a professor you know, who originally is from Colombia. And it was adopted. <laughs> but he moved. <laughs> it, it, so it's just and um, he studied at university in Paris and he started to understand that uh, the city was really big and one of the biggest problems that it was in there and where people were suffering the most was about the commute. So um, changing commute to community and therefore developing hubs, if we can call it this way, uh, clusters in cities uh, where everything is accessible in within 15 minutes of walking or cycling. Now, <laughs> Bas, who is a friend of mine, you can wave, and he's actually one of the ambassadors for Colive. Um, he is developing the first Coliving concept in Dubai, and when I went to see it two days ago, I raised something very interesting, and I think I was talking to you about it as well where I actually think that in a very strange and different way, Dubai is also a 15-minute city. Because I've been here, right? I've been here for two years, and every time I say to someone, oh, I have to go there, I oh, it's fine, it's like 15 minutes, maximum 20 minutes, get a taxi, 10 minutes, and you're there. True, the difference is that this is driving, right? But I think if you speak to a lot of people that live in this type of cities, where everything is within 15 minutes from you, you, they will all tell you, I love living here because everything is so easy. I don't have to commute a lot. I have more time for me. I don't have to wake up really early. I'm not stressed by the fact that, you know, there is a massive rush hour and I have to do all of that. So the whole concept of 15-minute city really is that. Of course, in cities like London, where I also live uh, most of the time, most of the time, uh, you cannot really implement that. Uh, so what you can do, the same thing that Paris is doing, is having little clusters, right? So creating these 15 minutes hubs around the cities, which then allow you not to have to travel as much in, but only on an occasion, and therefore having more time for what we can call community, which could be 
time for yourself, time to actually enjoy more what is around you, but also to find out. Because most of the time when we commute to a place, then what happens is that if you commute into town center, then you stay maybe there for dinner with your friends. You don't know what's happening around your place. You just go back to sleep. And all you know is another area, and therefore it's very difficult to build communities. Yeah, that's, that's very important because you said clusters and yeah. mini hubs. Uh, I have the theory that, that in Serbia, in the former Yugoslavia, we had that after the World War II. Uh, the literal translation would be uh, a, a place communities, a mesne zajednice. And it was working just fine. People were gathering in the circles of like 15 to 20 minutes. They were working there. They were, uh, their children were going to the kindergartens in around 15 minutes. So it's very, very important. So my personal opinion that that concept evolved. It's something that is called nowadays 15-minute cities. Even though we have, we are at, we are in the 15-minute city, Dubai. Dubai Except is a 20 minute city, apparently. 15 to 20 minutes. It's about five minutes, but they're working minutes, on it, yeah. but I heard 20 minutes. <laughs> yeah, cool, cool. It, it, it is really, uh, uh, to a certain extent, uh, somebody who lives here, you know, pretty much most of my, all of my adult life, all of my life, actually. Dubai is a 15 minute city by design. Why? Because the way Dubai is built, Obviously, Dubai is a relatively newer place, significantly newer place than Serbia or other parts of the world. But most communities are built in a way that there's the residential, the homes. Then there would usually be some areas that have, you know, some buildings that have, you know, not necessarily co-working spaces, but just nice coffee shops that are conducive for work. There would be at least a small mall or community center that has all the shops. So, like where I live, I I could live, I could stay there for weeks and not go anywhere because there's literally everything. Now, what enhances that now is because post the situation, um, there's been, of course, the acceptance of flexible working or the hybrid has been out of the roof. Literally, even the government lets government workers work on a flexible scale, which is quite telling of the the progressive nature of how. Um, the, the modern way of working is evolving here. Because of that, most people literally don't have to commute anymore yeah. because there's everything in there, literally up down to like golf courses and even things that you would think are a bit more extravagant. There's everything in almost every section of the city. So you, it is really, it's probably a 12 minute city. It's like, it's like 12, I, I, it's, Maybe that has something to do with laziness. I'm, I don't know. I, I don't, I'm not judging, but maybe the laziness a around here, it's, there is a little bit of that. So thank you. So we will uh, skip to the next round of questions. And since we heard uh, different angles, different uh, points of view of how do you see, uh, what, uh, what are your models of uh, co-working spaces, uh, how, uh, uh, how did you grow your communities? So now we are facing with a lot of challenges and a lot of new circumstances. So the biggest challenge would be how to integrate and how to make sustainable some physical space and some community in one area of 15 minutes or 20 minutes it is. So uh, I would like to ask all of you, this is a question for all of you, uh, how do you see this? Is there any kind of hybrid model that would suit perfectly for most of the parts of the Europe or the, or the world, and what are the, um, let's say, uh, ac actions that should be done by individuals, uh, companies, entities, and of course governments, which are supposed to be the, the force that will support and, or for example, to make that nice space somewhere physical so people can, can come. And I will start with that with uh, Julian, uh, with Jules. So uh, how did you succeed to integrate your local community into the coconut? You mentioned something about that, but uh, I know that in Mokrin House it was a bit different. They, they were really uh, looked as Martians when they opened the Mokrin House. So how was that with the, with the coconut? I mean, for, for sure we, 
not everyone in the whole region has come to Coconut, and the, for sure there's people who are not sure if they belong in the space. So that's what I meant before, that we are very active in like trying to get people in for different reasons. Um, it's, it was always important for us. Um, so we are a social business. That means that we've always focused a bit more on our social impact, environmental impact, more than our capital growth. Um, but at the same time, we're a business, so we also set up not a nonprofit. We didn't set up a charity. So we, we focus on building up a business where we're able to bring in different elements and not only be um, using public money, yeah. but we do work a lot with the regional government as well. Um, we will come to that later. Yeah, we'll yeah. come to that as well. Um, so the question was a bit, can you, uh, sorry, I lost my train of thought a little bit. I have to admit. <laughs> the question is how did you integrate your local community yeah. into your so space? To, to Besides, for example, buying the local goods for them, food or something like that. Did they yeah, participate well, somehow in there rebuilding the space? There won't ever be a cookie cutter model because, like, I know Mokron House is able to to really like buy things from the village, like locally produced cheese, and we just don't have that. That's yeah. not an option for us. But what we did do in the very beginning, when we 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 bought a manor house, so we bought a very important building, the most important building in our village. But our village is only about 50 people, um, but a, an important building for the region as well. Before we opened, before we began anything, we invited 60 people to Coconut, to the place. Uh, we, we invited um, 30 people from the region, and we invited 30 people from Berlin, um, which we knew Berlin was going to be our main um, sort of guest and also business case, but we knew we wanted to work with people from the region. So we invited them all together in one event. Yep. We, we did a design thinking like workshop, um, we invited all of these people to, to work in groups together yeah. with people they don't know to talk about what they want. We even had a kid group, so they, they wanted a playground, you so know, and then the village, the, the people, the, the, the 50 people in our village, the representatives from them, they wanted, um, they wanted to keep the local fire department. We have a little house with the volunteer fire department on site. They want to keep that. They want to be able to vote at our place. They want to have the village party there. And we said, okay, we can make those things happen. Yeah. And the, the Berliners had lots of ideas. Yeah. We made a lot of them happen, but not everything. Yeah. Um, so gatherings are very important. Yeah. So yeah. We, we, Offline the, invitation, the invitation was important. Yeah. I think, um, and then uh, after a few years, we also realized, um, you know, sometimes when we, we organize events, actually our village neighbors aren't coming. And then why is that? And then we've, We've been adapting, and like um, it takes it takes years for for trust to be built when you're not from a community, when you're coming as a new person. I mean, I'm a foreigner, for one thing, and then all of my partners are Germans, but none of us are from this region. So it takes it takes years to to sort of build up these trusts. It's a long run. We we identified a, a few leaders in the community. We for sure make sure we're on their good side because then. They sometimes will invite, um, say, the village association. So that's like, our village has many old people. They had their Christmas party at our place. Then we made sure we were at the Christmas party so that they could ask us about our project because they, there was lots of rumors. And then they're like, then they could ask directly to my co-founder, like, um, you know, what? I, there was a lot of rumors. Yeah. She was able to clarify <laughs> some of like them. Like everywhere, that's normal. Yeah, but. Um, I think the main component was that from the beginning, it was our intention to incorporate our neighbors, to cool. incorporate, be a part of the region. Cool. Thanks. Yeah. Mubarak, uh, for you, since Ace Place is a platform, which is commercial, uh, we need to have that uh, perspective of how does, even though it's a commercial platform, how, what's the added value for the community in Dubai? That is very important. Okay, so one of the things I really like, um, I, this will sound a, like a little bit of a digression, but I think it's important to the point I want to make. I really appreciate that, it, you know, even though the, the gentleman mentioned, you know, we have to avoid using community as a buzzword, but I really appreciate the, the emphasis we put on it and we don't just talk about, you know, even though we have people who are co-working managers, we don't talk about just the commercial side of things, we talk about the, the impact. What we're seeing, for example, is 
even in technology, just look at tech businesses uh, across the world, a lot of the companies are trying to shift away from hardcore marketing uh, by just spending marketing dollar down, you know, and going towards community-oriented marketing where it's more natural, where they actually um, focus on building community rather than marketing. Now, when you look at talking about this region, um, I also really like that he, uh, we talked about um, how community was at the core of, even back in the day, the, 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 the people who settled in the modern day Serbia. Um, if you look in Dubai, I don't know how many people live here, but we actually have a thing called the Medjilis. And the Medjilis has a whole, actually, this is something that you will find in the Medjilis a lot, but there's so much culture around it. And essentially what a Medjilis is, is just, uh, a sitting area, you've all seen pictures of what a traditional Arab sitting area looks like, but it's amazing how, even though this is something that as far back as you can go into Arab culture, you'll find the Medjlis is just the place where everybody comes back from work and they gather there and just talk. Now, it's quite incredible that exactly that culture is still alive today. Um, I would usually, I'm a little too busy for it now, but I still go to the Medjlis with my friend. It still looks exactly the same as it looked 100 years ago. And the activity that happens there, okay, maybe now we talk about girls, but we really just come together and, and, and just talk. Um, and it's amazing to see how that creates impact in individuals as well. So in terms of Ace Place, of course, regardless of the commercial aspect of the business, which is important for the business to survive, of course. Um, at the core of what we do is bringing people together. We only succeed if we do that. And because of that, most of our commitment and where we commit our resources is actually towards uh, activities and uh, business objectives that allow us to make it effortless for people to come together. Now, you know, I can talk about this here and say, you know, this is what we want to do, and it sounds, it, it, this is quite theoretical, but where it gets really special is when you see the impact in real life. So I'll give you an example. Um, there's an initiative called the Water Alliance, which is really uh, intended at just protecting clean water for the environment and uh, providing clean water for underdeprived uh, places around the world. And recently, they started doing events, booking spaces to do events through Ace Place. And one of the, 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 the first event that they booked and did there, um, the lady that was organizing the event called us after the event to just say thank you for how easy it was for her to find a space that was suitable for that type of event. Now, she didn't get a discount, she didn't get any incentive really, she paid the price, but she was so happy for how easy our technology made it for her to find not just any space, not just a hotel banquet, to find the right space for that. But what is even more, at least amazing to me was, the host of the location, it was a location called Unbox, it's an art gallery that is focused on sustainability. Um, the host of the location called also to say thank you, but he said, and I quote, this is the type of people I would like to host in my space. Now notice one thing, the key word there is people. He didn't say this is the event. Because so you would think about the business aspect of it, you would think, well, you know, he just want more bookings, more people booking to come and do whatever there, but he specified, this is the type of people I want. Now, what this means is he was actually really proud that an event of this nature, an event with this impact that stands for this, is hosted in his location. And for us, the ability, or at least I'll say for me as a founder, the ability to have created something that enables that type of uh, connection to happen where an event gets to meet the space that matches exactly what it stands for, I, I could do what I do just for that. You know, and I, that's why I appreciate what he says about, you know, it's about outcome rather than income. 
And you should consider about giving a discount to the charity projects who are held in uh, spaces which are booked on your platform. We, we, are, we are actually doing that. We, we, in fact, we're looking at uh, allowing, uh, you know, making it free for certain type of activities. Of course, being a startup, we have to kind of watch the way we do that. But we are looking at doing that um, because it, it means a lot to us. Now, another aspect of the impact is, um, of course, the way, based by nature of our platform works, we are also able to allow... Um, we, we are creating the infrastructure that allows uh, for more opportunities to be created for the owners of these spaces. You know, one of the things we found out, I mean, I probably initially thought this was going to be for co-working spaces or meeting spaces that are just meant to be commercial, commercially rented. Now, what started happening is a lot more spaces that previously, before our platform, will not rent their spaces or just even will not be able to rent their spaces, we're now tr using our platform. So we have um, a record shop. It's just a record shop, but it's designed in a way that you can actually rent it out. Now, the owner of that record shop now tells us that he actually is able to pay his rent better. It's more comfortable. It's easier for him to pay his rent because he is able to, from the rent money. Yeah. And turns out he always struggled because the money from records alone, because we don't really have a big records culture here, didn't really cut it. Um, we have galleries that are just galleries, and the, 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 you know, we have some galleries that the, the, the owners of these galleries, they are just people who are really passionate about art, and they wanted to create a gallery, a, 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 they wanted that gallery to be like a community for people who share this interest with them. There are much more opportunities for customized uh, events and customized uh, needs for people who are looking something on your platform. So that's a good thing. It's, it's, it is a huge impact, even though you're not giving them any discount. But yeah, I will. I, but I, I will. I, will ch I, I mean, I mean, w w we can talk about that after. But the, but the Thank interesting you. thing with that is now with a platform like ours, somebody can pursue their dreams. I mean, if you say, "Oh, I have a gallery because I'm passionate about art." But the passionate, passion about art doesn't pay the rent for the yeah. place. Because of what our platform allows them, the way our platform allows them to, 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 to rent their spaces out, they are able to keep that passion and actually run the, run the, the, the space. Cool. We, we will be hearing, I suppose we will be hearing more about that platform as it develops in the next period. So thank you. So Anna, uh, you mentioned that uh, uh, before that this was a, a big uh, dream come true when you had the support from our prime minister that that thing needed to be done. Okay, uh, think fast forward, the thing being, think big. So this is a huge milestone for uh, the city and for uh, our country in general to make that melting pot for the, for the, for the creative industries. You also mentioned that you've been working, uh, your background is from uh, film, music, and everything, and you were, you, you were supporting all those networks in Serbia. Uh, what is, since uh, uh, the first step uh, is done, so Serbia creates, is recognized as someone who is doing positive uh, picture and positive things for the creative industries, but is there any kind of strategy, for example, next five years? What is Maybe what is your next personal uh, milestone or goal for, since you have your dream, so what's your next dream about uh, Serbia Creates and Lozionica? This was not in your notes. <laughs> no, no, it wasn't, but I was just inspired by it. So. I'm not ready for this kind of <laughs> challenging question. Um, well, Lozionica was my big dream, now it's, uh, it's going to completely uh, <clears throat> take my attention for the next three years because we're now designing it ar to architecturally then we'll do the works and do hopefully open it in 23. Another one we're doing is actually a creative embassy in London where we are adapting this old wonderful building and it will be Serbia Creates Hub in London for all people who want to go and start their work or their careers internationally. Um, and so, so we have a lot of uh, other plans. These two are like the biggest, uh, cool. more hardest, let's say, things to do. But we are also establishing a music export office, which is also a passion project of ours. So we are mostly 
We want to support the industry, but also we want to help people get out of the country. Stay in Serbia, feel safe there for the quality of life, but, all, but work globally. And that's what we're trying to support. Also bring in international talent. So we have a whole... Safe, safe house for creatives. Exactly. And we do have actually really strong incentives in terms of tax credits, tax incentives, uh, online work permits that you easily get and work visas. So we want to bring in international talent. We have more demand for this kind of work than we have we are able to produce talent, so we are also bring, we also are welcoming international talent and want to prevent any brain drain and just yeah. have the young people feel supported and that they have opportunities and stay at home but work globally. So that's We that's have the someone dream. in the audience who will prevent that drain of uh, people going out somewhere else. So they will try to attract them. I Bringing them back, yeah. I'll tell you also my biggest dream. I, when I started working in the film industry like 15 years ago, I was trying to re-establish Serbia as a filming destination for international productions. So I established the film commission, I did all the work, and back then people were laughing at me. They were like, what are you talking about? At the time, there were like two films filmed in Serbia a year, and they were like, there is no film industry. Why are you saying it's an industry? It's, films are incidents, and it's, they're not organized in any way. But then we worked so hard, and now there's a huge explosion of the film yeah. production with the great film incentive program that I worked on so hard with the government back then. And now they, they're all working together so much so that now when we're trying to do a video for, for Expo here, they said we have no crew together because they're all so busy. Yeah. So I kind of, you know, did a bad thing for yeah. my own self. But I want to seem to happen for arts for gaming industry, yeah. for all other areas of creative industries in Serbia so that they can all live up their work, work internationally, bring in internationals um, to Serbia to, for example, produce music, play music, co-create music with the Serbians. So that's my dream. You dream nice, really. So, and we will try to follow all of your dreams since the two of them are already uh, yeah. They are living their lives, so we will uh, tell us if you have some other dreams in the future, and we will try to follow all your agenda. So thank you. Uh, the next question is to Katerina Mayoline because uh, she didn't brought her uh, uh, presentation because we agreed not to, but uh, he, whatever she was uh, uh, explaining about the 15 minute cities and what is Colive uh, on. 99% of those slides, you can see that community is the key. That's her line. And she's telling, she's telling about that all the time. Community is the key, community is the key. So uh, in order to establish those kind of working spaces, so we, we, we touched upon a little bit on the architecture, but the communities are the ones, and people uh, who are members of those communities are very important for any kind of space. There is no unique model that works anywhere, but what is, what's that, what is that that is very important for communities to gather in one place? Well, I think, first of all, it's all the elements, as in architecture is important, technology is important, the place, uh, how you furnish the place. Actually, unfortunately, Bas had to go, but I would have wanted him to intervene on that because he just did a fantastic job on his co-living. Um, but to build a community, I think what's very important is to really understand people. And you can do that by trying to go back in either history or culture and all of that and to understand what, if we are talking about 15 minutes city, if you're talking about one co-living in particular or, why, or one co-working, then it's a slightly different matter. But if you're talking about creating a cluster of 15 minutes city, what makes people want it to be there and to build that community, it's really understanding what is there and what people are seeking, what is missing. Because, like I left Italy many years ago, right? And it wasn't really a choice. I mean, yes, I chose to, I wasn't forced to, but I also did it because I didn't feel I belong. 
there. Yep. And I didn't feel I belonged there because what I wanted to do or what I dreamt about, which I'm very artistic as well, it's, no, we don't do it here. And instead of being, you know, instead of having a lot of replies that go like, ooh, why not? Which is very American, is very British, is very innovative. It's always, why? Why? That doesn't work. That is not here. Why do you want to open this type of cafe? Why do you want to do this sort of thing? So I think it's very important for, I love the fact that governments are really under, lo, governments or local authorities are really understand, are really, really understanding, sorry, the importance of really go deeper into what people really want. And even if it didn't work for you, or if you thought that it didn't work there in that moment, but what is that people seek? How, how do they feel like they belong in a place for them to want it to stay there? He was just saying a moment ago, like, I chose to leave here and I can stay here, I can leave here. Like, when he talks about Dubai, it's like he's in love, like, so much. <laughs> this is like, I was going to marketing for us to stay here. <laughs> but every time, he, he's like, but there is everything. Like, the other day we were chatting and he was like, what do you like about London? It's like, what do you like about London? I, I was trying to explain. And every time I was saying something, he was like, oh, like we have this here and we do this here. And, and, and he feels like he belongs here because it was probably the city. I don't know because I don't live here, but it was set up in a way that whoever you are and whatever you want to, you find a place in there. The same thing is for co-working, the same thing is for co-living. The onboarding and the understanding you know, of what your members, tenants, inhabitants want and how they will feel like they belong into that place. It's, for me, the only key to long-term sustainability of a place. I totally agree with you because I consider co-working uh, spaces and co-living spaces as a coffee shops. Uh, not every coffee shop you like to go so, but there are some coffee shops that you really, really like to have your coffee because you know some people who are already there, you belong there. Yeah, you will definitely go somewhere else sometimes, but it's okay to explore. And that's the thing, like coffee shops in the future, especially when co-working uh, spaces will thrive after this pandemic. So it will definitely be a concept of a, of a coffee shop where you belong and where you feel very comfortable to go. So it's, it, I, co I totally agree with you. So Steph, uh, you mentioned something and I think that's very important to clarify. Uh, we're all, now, uh, Bitcoin and digital nomads are the most hype words. So, and digital nomads are not the same as remote workers, and people are mixing that. And uh, since you've been working with the digital nomads, especially now, with you are uh, you are working with the uh, individuals, teams that are moving from one country to another. What are the biggest challenges uh, for your company and for you? to establish all necessities for them. Last time when we were speaking, you were telling me about the, the old building uh, that you need to do any kind of construction works and the laws are a bit different. And tell us about the challenges uh, with, the, with the remote workers nowadays. There's a lot, there's a <laughs> lot of challenges. I think um, it's an important distinction to do between digital nomads and remote working. Digital nomads by default have a lot more freedom, right? Most of them are freelancers or they have their own business and so on. When you go into remote working, and it's very depending on the country, but in countries like Germany, remote work is different than home working, which is different than office. There's a whole set of law that surrounds that. If you start moving around from one country to the other, then there's social insurance, health insurance, taxes that come into implication. And you'll see the the younger people, when you're 20, you don't really care, right? You just go, you pack your laptop, you start working from there, and, and it's fine until it's not, until you have to go to a doctor and then you have to use the health system and you're not insured and you realize, oh, damn, it's not so, so easy. And as an employer, well, we have a duty of care for our employees. I can allow people to work outside of the office. And I mean, you were asking earlier, is there a one way to solve the hybrid question? There's a thousand way, and everyone's personal interpretation of hybrid is different. For some people, it will be office versus home. For some people, it will be home versus 
you know, the world. For some, it will be just moving to the country, uh, the countryside, right? So with that in mind, as an employer, we need to, to make sure that wherever our people work, they are taken care of, they are safe, that they comply with the local regulation. And it's a hard exercise. We hear these days a lot of companies coming out in the news being like, our employees, they can work from wherever they want in the world. Spotify, for example, have come out in the last year saying that. But when you start digging on how that is possible, it is only possible if the company has local entities in those countries. Then the employee can move around freely. If that's not a given, then it's very, very hard. And as companies grow, well, they don't have entities everywhere around the world. It is not so easy to say, yes, we offer full freedom in this hybrid model. And to the other aspect of, of hybrid, right, we, we've been discussing so far how important it is to bring people together, whether it's through events, or food, or, or whatever, but hybrid is also how do you bring people that are not physically with you in the room? How do we bring them through the, fa the famous Zoom call or whatever tech is around so that they can also join, that you can build a community that is not only whoever is in the room, but really extends to whoever share that, the, your, those opinions or those concerns or just want to, to, to hang out without being physically together. So no matter how you cut it, it's not easy. Uh, but it's also, it's a nice challenge because it's opening up a whole bunch of possibility. Communities don't have to be necessarily a 15 minute city, right? The same way you can be living 15 minutes apart, but don't want to do it. So I'm going to have a video chat, right? Or we can have an event where we join two 15 minute cities. We can have, for Get Your Guide, we have offices in 17 cities worldwide. Our HQ is in Berlin, huge historical building but we want the Get Your Guide community to come together and that requires us to gather in person in our HQ and remotely bring in everyone else from, from around the world. So it's, it's, it's a new way of thinking and interestingly, corporates have been doing that for a while. International corporates, the big guys that you know, we tend to kind of ignore when it comes to community building they actually have had those processes and those ways of global thinking for a while. Granted, they're not necessarily the most optimal, but it's already in motion. So we can just leverage that, those best practices, and integrate it to solidify the, our communities. Cool. Can I intervene and say something? Yes, of course. Sorry. Sorry. So I would like to say something. First of all, I was really lucky that two and a half weeks ago, I had a tour of their building. And I, she can say, like, I, I, didn't, I didn't know we were going to be on a panel together. Like, and she wasn't there on that day. But as I walked around the HQ in Berlin, I just thought, this is how the future of work works, honestly. So if you have time, have a chat, because that building was amazing. And also, am I the only one who's very excited for what you just said about the fact that right now it's really difficult for companies to have a lot of remote workers? Yeah, everywhere in the countries. And maybe, I don't know, I think like you do in a, in a lot of things. And the more people say, oh, it's very hard to do this, the more I think this is such an exciting time because there is a problem that we need to solve. So I'm looking forward to a lot of creative technology innovators that are gonna solve this problem. Cool, thanks. So we are going on a third, third round of questions. Okay. And uh, we, uh, I think that we still have a little bit of time. Yes, we don't have to, oh, okay. So, uh, new ways of thinking, new ways of working, new normal, everything is new, but we are living all those aspects of our lives. So, uh, and it's very challenging, especially nowadays. And we see that we need to adopt very quickly. We need to accept uh, all the changes that are happening all around the world. And as, mu as much as we uh, do that as quicker as the others, it will be much better for us. So you all have been working on various projects. And for me, it's very important to know and to tell to the audience 
how are your projects uh, uh, have an impact and influence on the local communities? Because we said uh, local locally grown communities are the best ones, so we need to attract smaller ones so we can, so we can reach out um, uh, in bigger goals, to have bigger projects, to connect cities. So and Daniela will, will say more about that uh, a bit later. So uh, that is question uh, for, for, for Anna. Uh, we know that this is a, a long run, and you started uh, running for quite some time now, and every short run you win, and that's a very, very good thing. So uh, how, you how do you think that this will affect local communities, for example, in Belgrade? Yes, we said that we will try to attract uh, foreigners from all around the world, but what do you think, how will that attract smaller communities and that they will be willing to go there to Lozionica and to make their businesses, startups and all the other things? <clears throat> well, we, we, that's a very important part of the story. And we're thinking a lot about that. Um, how, to, how to make the whole space feel owned by the communities themselves. Um, and we hope to be able to do that by just making them very open to a very wide range of people um, for any sort of um, um, experiment or innovation and to bring different people together and that's how we'll promote it and we'll have separate parts of it some will, will be just straightforward co-working but we'll have fab lab and, um, and design thinking lab and um, uh, performing arts things and the studio for this and the studio for that and we want to ensure that they all feel at home and work together but also to attract um, businesses because we feel like even businesses need to get ideas from the creative people and to put them all together there so we hope to to have this constant to really make it dynamic and have it as a melting pot of these different people. We also hope very much for this to be a great example of how you use old industrial heritage buildings that are under protection of the government in modern 21st century yeah. world and make them not just useful but also sustainable and hopefully a good example of public and private partnership. And we hope this to be the first of its kind in Serbia, so that the smaller places and towns that each have their own little roundhouses or some sort of yeah. buildings that are just sitting there and they don't Empty. know what to do with them, yeah. to actually put them to good use and follow the example of how to make them uh, really useful, um, how to make them really build and gather the community, also attract tourists, uh, but also be sustainable in the long run. Cool. You, you gave a great foundation for Daniela, uh, and I will address the next question to her, because you said all the nice things, design thinking, creative industries, and she's ex uh, at this very moment working on those kind of projects. And uh, uh, Daniela, please tell us something about your newest and the biggest projects about uh, connective cities. And uh, since it's, a, it's a very important for all uh, experience to be shared, know-how, all the knowledge that we are sharing among not just among ourselves, but also among the cities, among the governments. Uh, what do you think? Uh, how will be uh, the reaction from the cities who are, uh, in, uh, who are embracing those kind of uh, design thinking for humans and uh, for the ones who are still a bit rigid and not willing to be a part of that network? Thank you. Uh, first of all, I want to say it's just so much input <laughs> and I just wanted to say like a million of stuff and my brain is kind of you know uh, connective cities okay uh, <laughs> I'm happy you're recording because I want to yeah. watch it again so but there were some other things that have been said before so first of all I said Berlin was easy um, I lied from a city perspective because um, of course no one in the public administration trusted our project in 2009. Of course, um, we didn't have a proven business model 
no bank wanted to lend money, and so on and so forth. Until one day, of course, they wanted to take a picture with us, and so on. Later in um, Lisbon, the mayor came at first to take pictures with us. We had a TV, we had newspapers, we had a lot of media outlet. So this is something um, where I think cities um, enhance their industries now can learn for the past 12 years, can learn from good practices and can learn from very bad practices. Um, can learn how to, of course, integrate the community through human-centered design methods, um, doing art exhibitions, running a TEDx um, chapter, uh, having a makerspace, meetups for hackers and techie people. All these things, all these interventions and elements have been proven, and it's great to you know, gather all of that. Nevertheless, it has also been proven that the cannibalization of this kind of grassroots movement by public institutions can also end badly, uh, can end having like billions of dollars invested in a huge, amazing marmor building that I've visited in the outskirts of Algier, publicly funded by USAID and GIZ, with everything that you can dream of, like a la carte, you know, uh, incubation space, uh, da, 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 this space, that space, everything perfect, like box checked and empty, completely empty because the community was missing. Um, and I think we should learn from, from these both stories, from the good practices and from the bad practices. Generally, governments don't, um, don't enjoy a big trust in, 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 in these kinds of disruptive communities. So it's, you were talking about artists, we're talking about pioneers, we're talking of people that generally don't trust the public government. Nevertheless, working with connective cities in the pandemics, it has started to, um, one and a half years ago, I think local governments have shown us how important they are and citizens more than ever trust local governments because they were the ones um, sending out the messages about security, about what you need to do. They were the ones running the services of the city. They were actually the ones, to me, the public servants that we have um, accompanied throughout their transition in, into this digital, physical, digital world, which they were new at. They were bureaucrats. I mean, people that worked since 20 years in a local administration don't know much about the digital interactions and don't know much about creative rituals like design thinking or hackathons or whatever. Um, and taking them by the hand in this community of practice called Connective Cities, which is a, a network of cities all over the globe, um, enhancing peer learning between cities, has um, proven how so many individuals have a dream for their own city, for their own town. Because it's not high level, with Beta House, you know, we were doing um, European Parliament lobbying to make some regulations, like really high level. I don't think they really had a dream for their town or city or country. But working with local governments, you see the passion in the people that grew up there, that have a story there, that want to get you know, the, the migrants back, that want to get the diaspora back, that want to get the brains back. Um, that really connects some childhood memories with this old factory that is now empty, where you know your grandma worked there, or you, you have these stories. And I think this is a chance now to use this post-crisis or still crisis, because um, you should never miss a good crisis, mm -hmm. and you should be prepared to, to, to get this window of trust that uh, citizens have in local governments and to really look at good stories and bad stories of the past 12 years um, and, and try to use this, um, the, 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 this, this window of trust. I don't think it will be long. I, I don't think it will be long. <laughs> I think things are kind of turning back to normal. And I can only invite Lujonica to join Connective Cities. Did I spell it, say, say it correctly? Lujonica. Um, and where... Uh, Basically, different city actors um, share stories and basically embrace the values of co-working, I would say. <laughs> um, yeah, that's... Cool, cool. I hope I could answer whatever was the question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Do 
Dubai is a classic place for like the whole, yeah. you know, the whole plan, yeah. everything, and it's empty, yeah. and no one is really using it. And this is a good foundation because now you were talking about the government investments, and now the question to you about the private investments. Since you raised a huge amount of money for your platform from angel investors, bravo! So, what they, uh, how they see this new economy, new way of working? Uh, uh, and you got that uh, uh, round of uh, financing uh, during the pandemic. So how did they see that? Of course, like you never miss, uh, 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 how do you say, you, you a, good, a good crisis. So what was the opportunity for them? How they see that? Um, yeah, so th this is actually a pretty important question because as much as we love all the things we care about, some things really need investments uh, that might not have to, might not, come from the government. Um, so this was obviously a big learning process for me. Um, obviously, as a founder, I didn't get into what, I was, what I'm building, thinking about what investors would care about. Um, but the, so, so for, for starters, the reality is investors don't care about community or all of the things we care about. They care about money. Um, and the only reason that, <laughs> well, they just care about just the money. Um, and the only reason why investors would invest in something is if they really see opportunity in it. Now, um, we were able to raise, you know, by the time we put our first, the first version of our product, very early stage actually, um, did a small pilot program. Um, we raised a million dollars. We were actually oversubscribed, so we have we had to say no to a bunch of investors, which is a very good place to be in the, in the venture space. You will uh, teach us how to do that. So well, we that's a different, that's a different game entirely. <laughs> um, and we were able to raise that money, I think we, we raised a million dollars in three weeks and quickly got oversubscribed, which usually for startups in our stage, it takes four months to raise $300,000. What is really exciting is beyond the money is who we raise from because our investors are really some of the most sophisticated, some of the, the, the best investors in the world from, um, you know, huge fund managers managing billions of dollars in companies like Mobadala, which is the biggest investment fund here, um, to fund managers from Silicon Valley. We have a very diverse international set of investors. Um, that came in at this stage mostly as angel investors. And for a company like ours to be able to raise this type of money, of course they know what we do, I didn't give them the Nigerian scam story. Um, it's quite telling that investors as well have really, uh, are very, very convinced that the future of how people are going to um, work and use real estate, because that's the word that's more interesting for them. For us, it's space. For them, it's, you know, they, they, they think of the square meters. But investors are really convinced that the way we are going to utilize space, and in fact, the way, we are going, the, way the community aspect of it is going to have impact is the future. And that's why companies like, like ours. But beyond that, actually, through the, my interaction with the, uh, the, the, the investors that we had during our round, um, of course, because of their, their, their influence and access around the world, I was able to find other things I even, didn't even know about. So what's quite exciting is that there's a lot of other companies that are also solving the way space is being utilized. And what we talk about uh, regarding like 15 minute cities, in different ways. So one of the companies I'm really excited about is a company called Reef Technologies. I think they've raised about $700 million. So they're in a much advanced stage than our company, of course. And all the, what they do really is they, re, uh, they basically reinvent how parking spaces are used. So basically they take over parking spaces, either lease them or buy them. The parking spaces still run, but they use a, a lot of the parking space to set up mobile kitchens, 
and logistic, uh, uh, you know, logistic locations. So basically, they have these pods where now Amazon doesn't have to deliver to each of the single houses in the area. They just have to deliver to one place in that area, and then they will deliver to the individual space. Now, that Micro concept... locations. Exactly. It, they, they basically, yeah, exactly. And that concept is so important to our ability to create 15-minute cities, if you think about it, because now... It becomes, for e-commerce, it becomes much easier for those companies to access very rem remote areas and be more global. Um, people can have, be because of the, the setup they have for restaurants, to be able to set up these very quick mobile kitchens in, in, in locations, people can have access to foods that they cannot be able to order otherwise. Um, and these companies, obviously, are getting huge invest this investment. And it's all because investors are convinced that this is the future. Investors are convinced that companies like ours are providing infrastructure to enable this inevitable future, really. Uh, future really. And so, uh, of course, it, it is quite telling that, that we are able to, 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 to raise that kind of money. And this kind of investment are going to that side. I'm sure that you will prove them that they are right because investing money in your platform. So. Good luck I with that. I hope so. I, I'm sure. So, huh? yes? Just, just because we're, um, we are moving into the corporate space and what investors want to, and I think we should really have a separate conversation about uh, the public and the private space because um, there, there, is, there is one general, um, I think, misunderstanding uh, that public governments should look at what investors look at, and they just have... Um, structurally and from a value-based perspective, just very different uh, uh, tasks. So while corporations and companies strive for profit, public entities don't do that by, by definition. Uh, and when public entities look at innovation, they should look at social innovation and not at technological innovation. And when some trends um, are interesting for, for big corporations or for the investment, I think it's where uh, a void um, happens, where the public sector has the duty to, to step in and fill in that void. So I think it should be complementary. Um, and I'm saying it's because I see a lot of cities, so I just came from the Web Summit, the biggest uh, tech, tech conference in the world, uh, where you have um, public p politicians talking on the same stage with, with, you know, big investors and Facebook and whatever, CEOs. And it's, it's great. I think it's amazing to see people having this conversation on the same stage. Um, nevertheless, um, the, the, the very definition of, of public um, uh, institutions is to take care of the broader public and not to create profit. So, if corporations start having their own um, innovation hubs, innovation labs, spin-offs, whatever they call it, uh, incubators, because corporations are too big and too heavy to actually enter the open innovation game, so that's what they do. It's a strategy, it's been done for 10 years. You just open uh, or buy startups, you invest in startups, you, you have your own um, incubator uh, and whatever. It's great, but I see cities doing that. I see the city of Lisbon talking about creating a unicorn factory. And I wonder, like, what? Why is the mayor of Lisbon saying they want to make a unicorn factory? And does he know what's a unicorn factory? <laughs> and, you know, so I'm like, okay, no, no, no. This is completely wrong. Why is it an electrical company working together with the city of Lisbon? I mean, I totally understand that public and private partnerships are a, a thing that has been proven right or circumstances and there's a lot of research on that. Nevertheless, I do believe that public servants need to look at citizens first and not at profitability and that corporations have their very own way of cannibalizing some of the good uh, community-based stories, which is fine, but it's another game and it's, it plays with different rules. Um, so, yeah. yeah, it's maybe because I'm primed because I've just been to this web summit and now I'm here and I'm like, hmm, we, we really need to understand what is the role of, of governments 
um, in, in making these spaces. And one of the biggest problems in Lisbon still is, and I remember 12 years ago when the former mayor showed me around, it was we have these empty spaces. The third space is the houses that are empty and you know dying and some kind of heritage problems. It belongs to five brothers, they are fighting, whatever. And 12 years later, what do you think is the biggest problem of Lisbon? The same. The exact same. Just that prices went high. Lisbon is now the startup region of Europe since 2015, attracted billions. Thousand coders in the next 10 years, and it's missing space yeah. that is affordable because gentrification is a thing that comes with co working and all that coffee stuff. I, I, I so, really, uh, sorry, I, I really like what you It comes with flat white. <laughs> what, what you said about the in part because again kudos to Dubai um, one thing that has been happening quite a lot in, in Dubai for example is uh, because the history of Dubai for example is moving here it used to be very much more expensive it is still relatively expensive um, but now there's a lot of initiatives that makes it easy for somebody an individual to move here you know there are cheaper visas um, there are freelance visas and things like that so Essentially, the reason why the government here is doing that is to also, similar to Serbia creates actually, is to enable more and more of this class of people to move here and live here. Um, but also going back to the investment uh, question you had for me, um, it's quite interesting to see the shift that is happening in the investor mindset as well. One of the most common type of investment in this region is really investing into real estate, and it's made investors a lot of money. It's kind of it's a classic here. And now you have, I mean, some of our investors are actually real estate investors who will only invest in some real estate project. You know, you're gonna sell how, this number of apartments, and this is gonna be the profit. And now they are like, oh, actually, this is not what's going to make us the most money in the future. Now it's more about the technology that enables better utilization of the space because there's already too much of it, especially here. So it's also interesting to see how um, the investor mindset is changing as well. I really like to believe that because mm -hmm. it's really hard for me. Uh, in my personal experience, that never goes. But yeah, I can totally agree with Daniela and with you. The things are changing at the moment and everybody needs a steady hand because uh, people who are doing on platforms, they don't know what will happen. We have a clue what might happen. Also, it's from the side of investors. What I think that we should fix about, uh, we should fix the, this uh, private-public uh, partnership. That's the thing that is missing. There are very few good uh, cases and there are so many bad cases what happened with the uh, three Ps. So maybe if there is some... And there's really good research on that. Uh, okay. We with will... really good models that people have cool. thought about a lot. So yeah. I think more, more thorough research. If there is a manual, manual uh, instruction for that, uh, yes, there is a manual. we can download it. Uh, about downloading the experience, I heard, yeah, I heard that uh, uh, a few weeks ago, you can download experience. I am totally opposite on that opinion. Uh, uh, Something that is uh, experience is a totally a, a category which cannot be uh, transmissioned easily. So your experience is different than mine. It's the same with the 15-minute cities. Uh, what do you think? Uh, is there any kind of model uh, of 15-minute cities that could, could be suitable, for example, for Belgrade to become a 15-minute city? Oh, okay. <laughs> Um, for me, and I'm going to say something which is maybe a bit a different, I don't think anyone was expecting this reply, but totally different city, totally different model, but Manchester. Manchester in the UK, I think, um, uh, I have been going to Manchester for really? a long time since I, uh, he's laughing. <laughs> but, Manchester, but, really? Yes, you have okay. to go. Uh, the last time I was there, which was a few months ago, I was very very much impressed. So they, re they, they make a whole place called the Northern Quarter. 
and they created these sorts of things. So it was a bit more of a rundown place, ex-industrial, not really. And they made it like super cool, co-working, hipster thing. They've ta they left a lot of building, very similar. Because huh? <laughs> you were talking about flat white, that's a hipster thing. Um, and and they, they left a lot of the building very similar. They just implemented it with very different thing. Uh, very London vibe, very New York vibe, very industrial, but it is, is a very strong hub for creatives and that sort of thing. And actually Liverpool did something similar with, I don't remember what is it called, but there is this area that they also, it used to be like the old docks and it was really run down, etc. And they did exactly the same. So they brought in a lot of very different tech hubs, co-working, co-living, could live in a little bit less, but like places where people can hang out, fitness places, places to spend time. Um, yeah, that's what I, that's what I would say. For me, that's how I say it. That like since I've been to Manchester a few weeks ago, I'm just like, okay, this is my fifth and menace city that really surprised me. And but what do you think? Uh, how much? Time will pass until uh, this 15 minute city become a buzzword like digital nomads, like Bitcoin. <sighs> Buzz concept, sorry. Or, or like the C word that we're not allowed to say. <laughs> um, I, I don't think it's going, I really don't think it's going to become a buzzword, actually. I think it's definitely going to be used by different places to kind of like put it here and there, like the same things happening with co living or co working even places that don't really do that. They just say, oh, we are co-living or we are co-working. Then you're like, not really. You're just renting room or you're just renting small office spaces that people share one facility. It's a bit different. So for sure, there is going to be places that will use that to attract digital nomad, remote workers, and people that really care about that. But I think the difference is that it would be very easy for, for the end user, let's call it like that, to really check and to say, well, actually, it's not true because it's going to take me half an hour to cycle from one side to another. There is not this and there is not that. Technology is going to allow us to, to really not let them use this sort of words because it will be very easy to see that it is. Uh, it's, uh, Coconut is a member of uh, German Federation, co-working federation, and for me, Germany is the best example how the rural co-working areas are thriving all around the Germany. So, um, how that happened? Uh, is the is the co-working federation uh, doing something with that? How are they involved, and how are they? We're not with them. You're not with them. No. You used to be with them. No. Sorry. That's oh, okay. That. No, we never were, but we were with other networks. Oh, with other networks. Yes. Oh, sorry. Sorry. My okay. Uh, uh, what do you think? What is possible to do in other countries besides Germany? I have, I'm like you. I have so many things in my head right now. <laughs> so many. I, 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 wanna, I actually want to touch on a few different things because I've kind of like, there's so many things, 15-minute cities or 20-minute cities. It's, uh, I mean, urban planners think about this 20-minute dimension, and I also think about it with the countryside. We're creating a hub. Uh, we're making a maker space. We've got, have had more than 10,000 people come to our place. We have local co-workers. We have, um, just by being there, we've attracted organizations and companies to our area. The, it's exploding in ways that we couldn't have imagined. Um, we have mayors and two, two mayors in our two towns. We have about 17,000 people in the two townships. The two mayors are super forward thinking. Um, one of them is a local guy from a really famous East German band and now he's the mayor of Bad Belzig and he's so cool. Like, he doesn't always get it but he, he, he wants like to promote this stuff, he's super cool. And the other guy, he's more young and he's, he wants to create like a, a creative hub, like a, bringing all the tech people in. So there's all this stuff happening. There's like co-working spaces opening up in our 
teeny tiny area, and actually I think it's super cool. Please explain to the audience how uh, small this area is. It's, like, it's like 17,000, including villages, tiny villages. Our village is less than 50 people. There's many villages. The biggest town is 10,000. Actually, that's including the villages. Uh, villages. So it's about 7,000 people in the town center. The other town is about 3,000. And then everybody else is in these little villages. And one thing we also noticed is like people, they don't want to travel 30 minutes to come to Coconut. So now there's like these little co-working spaces opening and it's super cool. So we're, I'm collecting them as, as I'm used to doing with the co-working world. Um, and now we just had our first meetup two weeks ago uh, with three of the spaces. There's like two more opening, like next, next month we'll have another meetup. So my thinking and uh, is that, yeah, we can have like these teeny little micro cosms of, of co-working in the village there with a good connection. And then once a month, we get everyone together so that we can create a bigger sense of community that we can share the bigger resources. Because we're, I mean, like if you think about 17,000 is just like a small neighborhood in Berlin. It's nothing, like in, like, but we're all spread out. So how to bring them together is, is one thing that we do. Um, and to touch on the public-private partnership stuff, I mean, so we ourselves didn't um, raise public money, but we, we founded a, a nonprofit together with um, seven other organizations in the region. And that nonprofit worked together with another think tank who wrote a proposal. So now we've, we've got a Smart Cities grant for 7 million euros for digital development funds in our region. And we were up against all the cities in Germany. And one of the things that they said to us that why, why our proposal worked was because we weren't just taking newspaper tech and saying, well, we want to have like smart parking. It was that we were actually considering the needs of the people. Mobility is a huge issue. And, and you deal with mobility in the rural space much different than in an urban space. So that we were actually considering the, the real problems of the people. And I think this is a, a little bit where this public-private partnership works because the public sector is so open for new ideas and, and they really are open. Like they don't, they don't put blocks. We worked in other areas where they, there was a big block. Banks are different. <laughs> we just got an apology from our bank. <laughs> we did. Because, we, because it's been, it was really hard to raise funds. It really was and then also in the, the, um, the time we will not speak about, our bank wasn't with us on a loan we asked for or tried to get. And now we brought all this other stuff in and we said, you know, actually it was kind of, we could have used your support, we're bringing new businesses and they actually apologized to us because they don't want us to talk badly about them to the new people. So I think, I think the a way the public sector can be positive is when there's projects where you, you see potential, is also to, to tell the, the banks and the investors, the people who only look at money, hey, this is good for the region and it's good in a broader economic sense because we all need it. Like we need, the creative people need to be there as a part of developing in different ways that you can't imagine. Diversity is super important. Our project is also, there's many, many places in, in Germany developing right now. Amazing cooperative living projects, a lot of co-working. There's a network called, um, uh, Cowork Land, which just Land means countryside in German. So um, that's that's a, a grassroots development of lots of small co-working spaces. Super fun to, to know them to work with, but very German focused. So I'm like me, and there's like a small contingent of us who are trying to bring in like how do you get international people, international people who already live in Germany. I mean, yeah, Germany so is a multicultural. <laughs> It's a multicultural space, but in the countryside, it's very hard to, to get in, even with the cool projects, because even the cool projects are only German, and yeah. it's really hard to get in. So we're working on ways to, to bring more internationality to, the, to this space, to this creative way of looking at the rural space. In so Aust these are the way, things yeah. that we're, we're doing right in now Austria that are really is exciting. pretty much the same situation. Yeah, well, and with the networks, I think this is where I'm trying to encourage more diversity within those networks. Yeah. So yeah. The, 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 the people who run the networks need to have international people in, that they think about it. I, even us, we, we set up a, um, a video editing suite. We're hosting film residencies now, and I, I wasn't there when they were setting it up, and I so I wasn't thinking about it. And now we have, like, our first 
amazing, like a, a Syrian filmmaker who lives in Berlin, and she's there, and she's like, ooh, I can't use the editing software, it's all in German. And I was like, oh my god, I wasn't there. You need diversity to make yeah. sure that you're able to, to set things up for many different people. And so, of course, now we're learned, and we're like, yeah, we gotta do that. Yeah. <laughs> but, it, but that's what, um, just the way of thinking is so different when you have a diverse team, um, when you invite um, diverse people, that you're really developing in a way that's that's open for everyone. I loved your slide um, with the the Venn diagram with like all of the things and how belonging is in the middle. And it takes all of these different things working together to have that real belonging. Yeah, diversity so. is definitely one of the main ingredients for every community, every community around the world. Thanks, Jules. So uh, the last question for Stephanie. So for your clients, you are trying to make a customized experience, but through logistics, providing them the ideal logistic for individuals and for the teams. Uh, for the global community, how do you think that this gap will be bridged uh, among supply and, uh, uh, and demand on global workers who are approaching to your platform? Or not just to your platform, but in general? It's a tough question. Uh, I mean, it, I don't think there's going to be a silver bullet to solve it all, right? I wouldn't sit here and tell you, yeah, this is how we're going to solve it. It's mm. very much uh, a question. From an employee side of view, from the growth that we have internationally, I think just the, the sheer addition of people and the way we think, the way we approach, you know, you briefly alluded to it, the onboarding, the how you bring people on board, what you present them, what's the, the culture, what the rituals are here, will help us bridge the gap, right? I think uh, pre-pandemic, we had ways of doing, now we have ways of doing. How we restart this whole engine will help us bridge the gap and move forward in a in a best way. I think, you know, let's let's take advantage of the time that have passed to press restart and, and build it better. Take the best out of co living, co working, this you know, this community spirit, bring it uh really ask you to give a big round of applause to our panelists. Thank you. Thank you for your insights. It was very useful. And if there are any questions from your side, please, this is your opportunity. Please, please. Two questions. Two questions. Thank you very much. I've enjoyed the discussion and conversation so far. But my main problem is it's more focused on developed countries. I come from Africa. I'm looking at Ghana. How do we create like 50-minute cities? I come from a place where cities develop before planning, which should not be the way. How do you see Africa or maybe Ghana catching up to the sort of cities you talk about, the hubs that can be created? making good use of empty spaces and all that. How can this conversation fit into my world? Thank you. Oh, yeah, <laughs> you saw me nodding. Yeah, you were nodding, so I'm like, Thanks. something go for us. Okay. Well, um, I'd like to the Innovation Gathering, which is a community of um, co-working space makers, um, owners, uh, maker spaces, uh, and hubs, that has started in Africa uh, and is expanded all over the world. So glo the Global Innovation Gathering is basically a platform for all these people that start co-working spaces, maker spaces, digital hubs in Africa. And um, technology-wise, the African continent is extremely um, advanced, um, also in comparison to, to, to Europe, um, for sure. Of course, the physical infrastructure might be missing here and there, but the digital infrastructure is there, and the mindset of the young people is there. So we are talking about the social technology that is there, which is the rituals of collaboration, the quick and agile way of moving and working, and we're talking about the digital technology that is there. Yes, indeed, cities 
from an urban perspective, have been planned uh, after they have been built. That is uh, correct. Um, but I, I will give you an example from uh, Lomé, um, where uh, a to digitalize their services. Because in times of C, I don't say the word, we are not allowed to say this pandemic word because we you have to can, pay five euros. You can't pay five late. euros. It's okay. Yeah, I know. It's safe. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you can't buy much of it in Dubai, I think. Um, so, um, so this is this is an example for me of genuine innovation that goes from this local hub, where you have all these young people hacking and making together, teaching now the the local administration how they can make use of data for decision making, how they can digitalize, digitalize public services. Um, and the stories go on from uh, face shields, uh, manufacturing, uh, 3D printing in, um, in, in North Africa where the supply chain from China stopped during the pandemic. So this space is stepped in to supply hospitals with, um, uh, with face shields or with other equipment. And these are stories that you don't hear from the old continent, because the old continent is very bureaucratic and slow. I think it would have been totally prohibited in Germany to produce anything like that and send it to hospitals. Um, so I, I would say go check globalinnovationgathering.com and Afrilabs and um, connect to those communities. Um, yes. Sorry, if I can add something also. I, uh, I can have a chat with you when we finish here. I can give you the details of our ambassadors actually from Kolev, uh, who is based in Kenya. And he's building something very similar in two or three different cluster area in Kenya. So maybe you can have a chat. Um, I, I want to add a little bit of it as an African. Um, I think everything, everything she mentioned is very important. It's actually the juice of it really, it's, it's the most important element. And I'm glad that some of the things you mentioned I didn't even know was going on already. But I think a very important thing that as much as we might not want to talk about it, it's just really leadership, you know. All of the things we talked about today are only possible because uh, people like Stephanie and all of the people sitting here uh, take an initiative to lead uh, you know, I mean, you have people going to villages to fight all the challenges against um, <laughs> that, that are almost against them to, to create this community and make things happen. So I think, and, and what is really unique is that we're sitting here on this panel with an active representative of the Serbian government with us talking about this very open-minded uh, towards the conversation. Uh, which means that the Serbian government is willing to listen. Um, and I think, hopefully, what, we, what I hope to see is that we would start to have some representative in the leadership or people in the, in, in the leadership in Africa, people who can actually create impact, who are willing to do what she's here uh, to do, who will take initiative because... Problems really leadership. I, I would just I agree with that. Underline that. But not. In the, and these solutions that is. A, Going back to what I said, is it's, it's a part of community building. We, we have common challenges, and and when we sit together and we discuss these things, we, we, there, are, there are solutions, there are things that you know, there are experiences that we have that we can share that can help you in Ghana, but also uh, you know in, you know also in Serbia, there, 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 these challenges also happen there as well, and and I think um, building community, building workspaces that are sustainable, which is very important, not just things that are built this year in 2023 and then by 2025 it's, it's, it's empty or it's finished. I think it's, it's, it's time. Yes. 
and I think, as I said, we, we have the solution. So we need to discuss things after this. Um, you know, you, you have a, a, an amazing project that we would all like to be a part of and, 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 and lend our experiences to. So we should, you know, we should help each other. You know, what you're doing here in Dubai, come back and see it and be a part of it as well. I think that, that those touch points is what sustainability is all about. So we can support each other if we stay in contact. Wow. <laughs> My business card. <laughs> another, another question? questions, then we can end this panel and this conference of ours. And uh, I don't know about you, but I really, really enjoyed and I learned a lot, even though I thought that I uh, know many of those, but I don't, obviously. So right. um, what I've been seeing and I, what I've been hearing today is that the change is the only constant in the human lives. And uh, since we are here, and you will get the chance to uh, get, to, get to know a better uh, Vincha culture, uh, the basic human needs have not changed much from that period. And that is very, very important. People from that period, they were changing because uh, of the innovation, because of make gathering, gathering in the cities. Uh, today, we are under these circumstances and under this pandemic, we need to change. But our basic needs have not changed much. We need people. This is why we gather at the end, because we need to, to share our experience. Uh, there is a biological theory that uh, destroys one species unless she provides all the circumstances for making another one. And I always translate that because we pick every, everything from the nature. Uh, I think that's what is happening right now with the spaces, with the offices, with the hybrid models of working. And it happened in 20 months ago, something happened to us, something happened to the office space, and now it's changing. It's evolving. We don't know how it will look like in five, ten years, but we need to listen. We need to follow all the, all the trends that are going on, and we need to support each other, like Alex said. We need to rebuild sustainability every time when some big change hit us. So that being said, said I really invite you. Okay, Martin, please. I, I, Everything that we've been saying today has just reminded me of one thing that wraps this whole thing up really nicely. So if you forgive me, I'm going to jump in. As we started off with the stories of migration, as we stopped with the stories of community and of Africa, in Southern Africa there's a saying, which is if you want to go somewhere alone, go together. But that nicely solves all of what we've spoken about today. Exactly. I don't know what to say else, except one, once, uh, uh, once again to say thank you for being here and invite you to uh, take a look of Vincha culture and to get to know it better and to see uh, how our ancestors lived and what did they provided for us so we can learn a lot. Thank and you Daniela, for your leadership. Again. I want to say something from all of us, I think. Yes. Thank you for your leadership, because going together only works if someone makes sure that everyone, that, that you get all the <laughs> sheeps together. And thank you for your leadership and for your work to bringing everyone together I, at I this panel. I think we kind of underrated, because um, I, I have an idea of uh, how much hard work we put into putting that first conference. You know, putting a conference for the first time is not easy at all. I cannot imagine. But I personally struggle with made it a point to ensure that I got all the documents I needed to travel and it wasn't easy. So, of course, we, it's important that you share that appreciation. I was just begging and crying. Katarina did all the work uh, two years ago. So, 
she's the one, she's the one that, that, that you even came to Belgrade. So thank you. I'm the godfather, like I said. <laughs> so once again, thank you. And let's all of us go and to see uh, and to learn something about Vinci culture. Thank you.